So one of the most repeated prayers I hear, as I mentioned before, is, um, is the one for wisdom. We ask for wisdom uh, to do the right thing. We ask for wisdom to make the best decision. We ask for wisdom to know God's will. We want to know the A plan for our lives, not the B plan. In his search for wisdom, we look for signs many times. Uh, we talk about open doors and closed doors that God will open for us. In other words, we look for clues to God's will in circumstances or in physical things or events that somehow may point the way. We just want to know, you know what does God want us to do? Some believe that God's wisdom comes to them in dreams or perhaps an inner voice or through the advice and instruction of some other person. And I'm not, I'm not discounting the fact that there are some, you know, some people who think like this, there may be some truth to all of these things, and that we often can trace the direction of God's will through a variety of methods. After all, you know, God is not limited. He can draw us to His will and His wisdom in any way that He wants, through a set of circumstances or an individual, or perhaps a thought that we have in our heart. However, if we're seriously looking for God's wisdom and how to apply it to our lives and situation, the best place to look for it is, of course, in His Word. We're aware that the Bible contains the wisdom of God, but in the book of James, we find specific instructions concerning our finding and our using of this wisdom in our lives. You see, James provides the seeker of wisdom with guidelines to help choose one's way between the different types of wisdoms that exist in our world. And I know that Marty is doing a, a series uh, on um, James in, a, in, in the auditorium with the men, and of course uh, Laura and Jeannie uh, Johnson are doing uh, a series for the ladies, and I thought I'd try my hand at at a lesson in the book of James, so rich, so many great ideas, so many wonderful teachings in that book. Now, it's important to know this idea that there are a lot of wisdom, because not all wisdom comes from God. And in order to do God's will, in order to have His plan, you want, to, you want the A plan, you want God's plan, you want that plan to be in operation in your life, our actions need to be generated and guided by His wisdom. You can't have His plan with just your wisdom. You've got to have His wisdom. His wisdom will give you His plan. So James teaches that you will know what kind of wisdom is driving you or driving your choices in life by examining the results that you're having. I mean, if you look at what your wisdom produces, you will know where your wisdom is coming from. And knowing this will help you in two very important ways. First of all, you can try on a decision when you're not sure in order to see what it will produce. And what it will produce will usually tell you which wisdom is at work, which wisdom is at the base of this particular decision. And hopefully that'll make your choice a little bit easier. And then many decisions and issues in our lives revolve around people. And so examining carefully what is being produced in someone's life in light of James' teaching will help us to know what's in that person's heart. Because you see, we can all be fooled by looks, we can all be fooled by words, but a person who has God's wisdom in their heart will produce God's will in their lives. And this will be evident. So let's look at what James has to say about the two kinds of wisdom. Let's open, please, our Bibles to James chapter three. And we'll be reading from James chapter three in just a few moments, just give you a chance to get to that particular passage. Now the passage preceding the teaching that we're going to talk about, um, it talks about the power of the tongue, especially the power of the tongue for destruction. Among other examples, James compares the tongue to a fountain, saying that the same fountain cannot offer up both bitter 
and fresh water. His point is that if this is so, there must be something wrong with the source. And so it is with the tongue that is both bitter and sweet at different times. This is an indication that there's something wrong with its source. And the source of the tongue, of course, is the heart. So this point leads to the discussion of wisdom, which is what fills the heart, which is what powers the tongue, which in many ways gives direction to our lives. So James says that there are two types of wisdom. The first one he mentioned in chapter three, beginning in verse 14, which I'll read in a moment, is the wisdom that comes from below. Now Satan was the first to exemplify this type of wisdom. In Genesis chapter three, verse one, he, it says the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord has made. And so earthly, worldly wisdom is clever, is shrewd. Worldly wisdom is self-serving, shiny. It gets the job done, but its fruit, James says, is unmistakable. So let's read chapter three, verse 14. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. In his discussion of wisdom, he says wisdom from below produces and revels in uh, strong envy and rivalry, selfish desire for position and privilege, boasting and arrogance. You know, when he says, and so lie against the truth, he means to claim that these things can't actually come from any other source than worldly wisdom. In other words, don't puff yourself up, don't be a hypocrite. When this is the result of your wisdom, you are operating under the influence of worldly wisdom. He goes on to say in verse 15, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. So James calls a spade a spade, if you will, in defiance of those who would justify actions motivated by wisdom from below. The results, he says, are plain to see. They are strictly from the earth, fleshly, devoid of the Spirit of God. And they, like all things inspired by worldly wisdom, are in the purview of Satan. Satan doesn't only work you know, in the occult or those who practice the black arts. Satan is alive and active on Wall Street and on Madison Avenue, as well as in schools and government, the local bar, even in the church. Satan is at work. You know, what feels natural to man is often quite ungodly. Feelings are no guide for truth. Feelings are no judge for righteousness. And so worldly wisdom is manipulated and promoted by Satan who knows too well how to appeal to our flesh and how to appeal to our emotions in order to unwittingly get us to serve him and think that we are doing what's natural. You know, it comes natural to me. Satan is the one that makes us feel that his wisdom comes naturally to us. And so in verse 16, James summarizes the net result of worldly wisdom's product. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. He says disorder, disorder in thinking, disorder in families, disorder in society, disorder in our relationship with God, disorder in the church. You know, it's not of Jesus when people in the church are mad at each other and they fight with each other and they give each other the silent treatment, they won't talk to each other, they won't associate with each other, they won't have fellowship with each other. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. And if it's not the work of the Holy Spirit, if it's not from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, if it's not motivated by the Holy Spirit, exactly who is motivating that type of behavior? Well, James is very clear in telling us who and why that behavior takes place. He says, every evil thing. 
Worldly wisdom is capable of producing every kind of sin. James traces the path. Worldly wisdom leads to jealousy and selfish ambition, and from these sins of pride can come in every type of disorder and every type of sin. Now James doesn't give a, an exhaustive list of sins and situations. He only lists a few and he alludes to the rest. In other words, you know, he's saying, you get the idea. You get the idea of sins like these. The point is that when you see things like this, when you see things like pride, when you see things like selfishness, like disorder and so on and so forth, know for sure that it isn't God's spirit or the word of God or the wisdom of God that is at work. Now that should be fairly easy as a lesson to acquire, but when people are in a hurry, or people are in love, or people are tired, or people are depressed, or weak, or ignorant in faith, when people are being tempted, they often overlook the signals, and they rush ahead making bad decisions based on worldly wisdom anyways. Now the way to make this principle work for you is to look for the signals and believe those signals when you see them. If you see dispute, if you see disorder, if you see division, believe the signals. Know that this is the devil's work. This is not the work of the Spirit. All right, now he talks about, as I say, he's talked about the wisdom from below. Now he talks about the wisdom from above. Chapter three again. Verse 13, he says, and this is the beginning of the passage, I didn't read from the beginning, I wanted to cover the wisdom from below to begin with. Now he talks about the wisdom from above. In verse 13 he says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So James introduces this verse and a little later on in verse 17 and 18 explains what true wisdom is, what the substance of true knowledge consists of. And he summarizes what this knowledge and wisdom produces. He says it produces a good life marked by good deeds done in humility. This, of course, as opposed to deeds done from a selfish ambition or deeds done from, self, uh, from uh, jealousy or strife. The one who claims wisdom, the one who claims to have superior knowledge, James says, will demonstrate it in good deeds done in humility. That's how you'll see it. That's how you'll know it. Look at the signs. Let's read verse 17. He says, um, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. So in this verse, James picks up the thread of ideas that he began in verse 13, and he ascribes true wisdom and true knowledge to God who is above. And then he goes and gives more detail as to the quality of this wisdom. We know what the wisdom from below looks like. We know the signals, if you wish. We know the markings of that kind of wisdom. Now he says, let, let, let me give you the markings of the wisdom that comes from above. What does this wisdom look like? Well, he says it's, it's pure. In other words, no secret motivation, no pride, no self-promotion, in addition to being morally and sexually pure. He calls it peaceable, as opposed to envious and disorderly. Wisdom from above brings calm. It brings quietness to one's soul. It brings peace to one's surroundings. Wisdom from above is gentle, meaning not self-willed. A person who can submit to authority. A person who can be flexible to accommodate limits placed on them by circumstances or by trial. A person who can do it your way and still be happy and at peace. He says, wisdom from above is reasonable. 
one who is considerate of others, one who seeks fairness and not only the option that will please self, one who is ready to obey, a person who is reasonable, full of mercy, he says, a person who is not critical but forgiving, not just sympathetic but empathetic, full of good fruits. In other words, wisdom from above doesn't just produce fruit like success or power or money, Wisdom from above produces the good spiritual fruit of love and joy and peace, along with the other things as well. Unwavering, he says, the wisdom from above is unwavering, solid, dependable, consistent, trustworthy. And then he says, without hypocrisy. This whole package here of wisdom, sincere, sincere, frank, honest, open, transparent, vulnerable. That is the wisdom. Those are the signs that the wisdom is from above, that the individual is operating on wisdom from above. And then in verse 18 he closes out the idea and he says, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So James summarizes by saying that what makes for righteousness, in other words, what produces right living, the right choices, the right actions before God, is the planting of heavenly wisdom, which is the seed. And planting this seed in ways which will reflect wisdom from above, peace, by people who are guided by wisdom from above, those who make peace. The people who are guided from above are those who seek and make peace, and what they sow is peace. In other words, it is evident who are the people guided by wisdom from above. They are the ones bearing and sowing the fruit of wisdom from above in this world below, and the ones who live and promote the peace of Christ between brother and sister, between God and the individual. And so I started by telling you about you know, right choices. Making the right choice is not easy, but when our decisions are accompanied by the things mentioned by James, purity of purpose, peace of mind, submissiveness, fairness, kindness, consistency, honesty, you can feel secure that the door that has opened is one that God has opened for you because Satan can also open doors. And the only way to know the difference at times is to see what fruit will be produced if you walk through that door. If you walk through door A, what will be produced? Peace, consistency, fairness, kindness, honesty, the building up of the kingdom of God, good fellowship, growth in the spirit. Is that what will happen if you go through the door? Or if you go through door B, what, what will happen there? Will it cause division, anger? Is it all about selfishness? Is it all about pride? That's how we make decisions. When these markers are evident in your life, then you can be confident that you are operating on God's wisdom and not simply your own wisdom. When your choice or decision helps you become a better person, when your choice or decision helps you to be a more spiritual person and even those around you are blessed by your action, then you are doing the right thing. Then you are choosing God's way. Then you've got plan A in operation. Now, when we hear a lesson like this, a lot of people say, you know, maybe afterwards, they say, well, why, why didn't you tell me this a long time ago? You could have saved me a lot of trouble. I could have made a lot less bad decisions. Well, we can't change the past. We even have a hard time forgetting the past, especially our mistakes. But wisdom from above guides us to put our past into the merciful hands of God for forgiveness. And forgiveness, of course, comes in two ways. For those who have never been to Christ, this calls for repentance and baptism, 
for the remission of those sins, those mistakes in the past. And for those who have been baptized but have been unfaithful or unfruitful, this calls for a prayer of repentance and restoration, 1 John chapter 1, verses seven to nine. For all of us, however, who consistently struggle with making the right choice, I encourage you to hold your thoughts up to the test of the two wisdoms. Ask yourself, are you operating by the wisdom from below? Are your choices based purely on self-interest and create anxiety and disorder and jealousy in your life? If you're not sure, just look at what your life has produced in the last five years and you'll know what kind of wisdom you're operating under. And then the other question is, are you operating by the wisdom from, well, from above? This will also be evident by the spiritual fruit that you produce, not just in yourself, but the spiritual fruit that you produce around you and in the people around you. Let's put it this way. If you're constantly apologizing and asking God to have mercy on you because of your decisions, you're probably basing them on the wisdom from below. And if on the other hand your prayers are full of praise and thanksgiving no matter what your lot in life is, then you are bearing the fruit of wisdom from above. Now that we know, let's start making better decisions. Let's start making better choices that will bless our lives and that will bless the lives of people that are around us. If today you've made the decision to be right with God. If that was the decision that was going on in your mind as I spoke to you the word from James, if the decision in your mind was to be reconciled with your Lord or reconciled with your neighbor, to make peace with someone, this decision to grow spiritually or to lean on the Lord for help, I can tell you that you have made the right decision I can tell you that the wisdom that you have based that decision on is the wisdom from above. On the other hand, if you've thought about that and decided to put it off till next week or next year or next Sunday to a more convenient time, then I can assure you that the, the wisdom that you used to get to that decision was the wisdom from below. Anytime you want to come to God and you hear a voice saying, not now. Be sure that that voice is not the voice of Christ. If you need to come to the Lord in repentance and baptism to be restored simply for prayers in order to help you walk as you should and make right decisions, the elders are here and ready to pray with you and for you and the brethren are here to support you in that desire. Please, Think these things over and make the right decision based on the right wisdom as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.